Good afternoon, everyone. This is attorney Catherine Henry. I am the um, owner and lead attorney of Catherine Henry PC. I'm also the founder of the Restore Freedom Initiative here in Michigan. I'm doing this video uh, to explain and differentiate the three petitions circulating in Michigan. Uh, two are actively circulating and one is awaiting circulation. Um, the first is the Restore Freedom Initiative petition. That is my constitutional amendment petition. We have been circulating since um, May 30th and um, are well on our way with hundreds of thousands of signatures. The second petition is the repeal of the 1945 Emergency Powers of Governor Act. And that petition started a week or two, I think two weeks ago. And um, I have no idea where they're at in terms of number of signatures. And the third is the um, recall of Governor Whitmer petition. And that is not circulating yet, but is scheduled to begin circulating um, in two to three days, depending on how they look at the time frame. So wanted to give you a little bit of information about each. Um, let's see. First of all, I want to start by saying that each and every one of those petitions in general is going the same direction. It's trying to stop the insanity that we've been seeing in our state since the beginning or middle of March. So they are all um, going in that, in that same direction. This video is not meant to um, disparage the idea of or participation in any of those um, petitions. Quick sound check. Are you listening to this? Mm -hmm. Is it working okay? Okay. All right. So um, first, I wanted to go into the recall um, petition time frame and information about that. So there's been some misinformation that have been circulating. Some of it is just people are making assumptions, and some of it is leaders of various groups involved. Uh, have been inadvertently passing around misinformation about the law involved. So to the extent that um, I, um, I'm i not involved in any of the repeal, or excuse me, the recall petitions, but I have had uh, direct communication with several of the leaders involved with the various movements to try to get the governor recalled and uh, others in uh, state government recalled. And so uh, due to that, as well as uh, the fact that many of you, thousands upon thousands of you, constantly are asking me questions every single day about the various aspects of uh, what's going on in Michigan state government and what our laws actually say on the point, I figured I would actually um, take the time to break it all down for you and give you a better understanding. That way you can choose to, um, you know, whether you want to circulate the recall petition or not. You can choose to uh, decide whether you're going to sign the recall petition or not, or uh, whether you just want to know the facts and it doesn't actually change your uh, decision uh, either way in any of those things. So with that being said, um, the first step that you have to do in a recall is to file the petition language the, the recall language with the, in this case, um, I guess let me back up and say, I'm going to cover recall laws specific to the governor, lieutenant governor, secretary of state, and attorney general. So with that in mind, uh, the first step that you have to do is file the recall language. And that is uh, the start date for the next few steps going forward. So let's say, that after watching this video, one of you wants to file recall language on the Lieutenant Governor, or the Attorney General, or the Secretary of State. By the way, I'd be more than happy to look at that language for you ahead of time to assist you in making sure that it meets the legal requirements. 
Um, or if somebody else was trying to file uh, language for uh, the recall of the governor. As uh, I'll talk about the status of the various language submissions that have been made so far to recall the governor. I'll talk about that in a minute, but if somebody else was interested in doing that, um, I'd be more than happy to look at that language as well before you submitted it to the Board of State Canvassers. So, let's say somebody was interested in doing this, and by the time you got to you know, drafting it and doing whatever, or if you had me look at it, or you had another attorney look at it, or whatnot, by the time you actually filed it, let's just say it's going to be a, a week from Monday. August 3rd. So August 3rd would be the start date for all these other statutes. Within tw 10 to 20 days after that point, it can't be before 10 days, it can't be after 20. 10 to 20 days after August 3rd in this example, the Board of State Canvassers must determine if the recall reason is factual and of sufficient clarity to enable the officer whose recall is sought and the electors to identify the course of conduct that is the basis of the recall. So what that means is you can have one reason, you can have five reasons, whatever reason or reasons you list, they must be clear and they must be factual so that any person who wants to sign will be able to know exactly why you're trying to recall the governor. So um, obviously you don't have to list every single reason, right? If you are upset about, you know, the fact that she shut down businesses, if you're upset that she um, shut down essentially all the courts, and she shut down the Secretary of State's offices, and she um, essentially suspended uh, parent-child relationships for children in uh, foster care homes, or um, the ability of parents to see their children that are in juvenile delinquency facilities or um, it, the fact that because of all the shutdown people couldn't get counseling or go to AA meetings or NA meetings or uh, receive surgeries or uh, be able to buy paint or seeds or be able to earn money to pay for their rent or their mortgage variety of things, right? It could go on and on and on, the amount of things that she has done in these last few months. So you don't have to list all of them. You can just choose to list one of them. And if whether you list one or whether you list five, it has to be clear and factual. That's it. So within 10 to 20 days after you file your language, the Board of State Canvassers has to decide is that language in fact clear and factual. And that is based on MCL 168.951A. Um, then, after they do that, let's say you put something on there I'll just pick on the governor. Let's say the governor, uh, there's recall language submitted and it was submitted on August 3rd and uh, we're going to say, um, oh yeah, I realized that in my dates I actually should bump up everything by 10 days because I went on the, the inside date there. Um, but let's say on the outside of that, uh, they take up to the 20 days to be able to decide on the language that you've submitted. That would be August 23rd that they would have to decide that by. So let's say on August 23rd they decide, yep, that's clear and factual language and um, you can proceed. Well, then the governor would have um, 10 days, up to 10 days to file an appeal of that recall language. So if it was the um, 23rd of August, it would be up to 10 days after that, um, so that would be September 2nd, I believe. Um, and so then if an appeal is filed, that would be filed at the Court of Appeals. Um, and that's MCL 168.951A that is requiring all those pieces. So then assuming there is a recall filed, and assuming that, let's just keep picking on the governor, let's say the governor um, has decided to file an appeal, then what the law says, and this is also 168.951A, is that the process 
for that appeal to take place can take no longer than 40 days. So let's say the Court of Appeals actually gets it on the calendar, gets it on the, the court's docket, and issues a decision within 12 days. That's fine, and it'll be done in 12 days then. But if the court decides to do nothing, if there's no hearing actually scheduled in that period of time, then like what has currently happened um, in the, the governor's appeal of the most recent recall language, then the law says that that appeal process cannot take any longer than 40 days. So if nothing has been done, then at the 40th day, the recall just gets to proceed uh, forward. So once you have that, happening, either the Court of Appeals has made a decision or 40 days has elapsed, whichever comes first, uh, then that's considered the start of the petition circulation. So at that point, from that point forward, uh, the law says that the petition is only good for 180 days. So from that point forward, um, if we were going with the um, up to 40 days for appeal, that would have brought us to October 12th. So at that point, um, you have, um, in this example, October 12th would be the start date of when you can start circulating, okay? So assuming you started right away on that first day that you're able to start circulating, well, you only have 60 days to collect all the signatures. And that is required under, um, 168.9612D. So, first of all, that 60 days, it doesn't start, that part doesn't start necessarily right away upon you being able to, being able to start collecting signatures. The 60 days starts upon the first signature being received. Um, and so you have 60 days from the time you've collected that first signature until all the way through uh, the date when you turn it into the Secretary of State's office. That's 60 days. So if I were you, if I were the one running a recall petition, I would do it like the um, uh, Chad Bossie petition was intending to do in the first place on July 4th have that huge event and start collecting signatures and it was going to be this whole big July 4th thing at the Capitol, that would be great because then you get thousands of signatures on that very first day and you just keep rolling right on uh, straight through for the 60 days. So speaking of signatures, you need 25 percent of the votes cast for governor in 2018 and that's actually um, required under our state constitution, Article 2, Section 8. So in 2018, if you add every single vote that was cast for governor, for any candidate, it was 4,250,585. So for the recall, uh, the Restore Freedom Initiative petition, we only need 10% of those. But for the recall petition, you need 25% of those signatures. So that means you need 1,000,000 62,646.25 valid signatures. Of course, you'd always want to have a little uh, extra for the margin of error, uh, but that would be the base number, 1,062,646.25. Within, within seven days of collecting the signatures and turning them in, the Secretary of State would have to determine if the petition is in proper form and if there are enough signatures. And that is uh, from MCL 168.961. Within 15 days of turning in those signatures, the signatures must be verified by the local clerks. And that is, um, excuse me, that's within 15 days of, of them getting those signatures. So that is um, also 168.961 subdivisions 4 and 5. So within 30 days, the Secretary of State must make an official declaration of sufficiency of the petition and the signatures. And so that would be required under MCL 168.963. Um, so, um, that would be 35 days from the date that they were turned in. 
So, um, at that point, the law says, assuming that you've collected, you, you have the language approved, you've um, had to wait through the appeal uh, period, you've then had your 60 days to start collecting, and let, we're assuming that you started collecting right away at the first possible moment. You took the whole 60 days to collect, you turned them in. Then the law says that um, from the date that the signatures are filed with the Secretary of State, you have to wait at least 95 days. I have no idea what the good reason for that would be, but you have to wait 95 days. And at that point, if we're talking about the governor's race, on a recall for a governor, it would be a special recall election that would be held, but that can only be in May or August. So a normal May election date or a normal August election date. And that's required under MCL 168.963. The question that would be posed to people would be, shall Gretchen Whitmer be recalled from the office of governor? And all you as a voter get to do is select yes or no. That is required under MCL 168.975E. So if there is a majority vote for a recall, the governor is immediately placed, excuse me, immediately replaced um, per the requirements of the Michigan Constitution in Article 5, Section 26. So that means once she's replaced, she would be immediately, uh, the, the lieutenant governor would immediately become governor. And um, after, um, well, and that's, that's also 168.975G. So, if we look at 95 days from the date that you file the signatures, okay? So, again, we're going to back up and say, we're assuming August 3rd, someone files some recall language. You go through all the steps. It would be, um, uh, you have to have that time for appeal. You have to have that time for language approval. Um, you have to have the time for the 60 days. You, you only get 60 days to be able to collect over the 1 million signatures that you need. So the soonest that would be happening is December 11th, 2020. So from that point, we have to wait 95 days before we could ever have a recall election, which means the soonest we could do an election would be March 16th, 2021. However, at that point, there is no election then, so we would have to wait until the next regularly scheduled May or August election. So that would be May. I don't know what the exact date would be, but it would be the first week of May, 2021. And that is the soonest point at which somebody else could take the governor's seat. And according to our state constitution, Article 5, Section 26, it would be the lieutenant governor in place at that time that would take the governor's seat. Uh, just as a side note, if something happened to the lieutenant governor and, and he was not able to take uh, the governor's place, it would be the secretary of state that would take over. If for some reason that person was not able to do so, it would go to the attorney general. If that person were unable to do so, then it would continue um, in succession to the um, Senate majority leader and then the um, Speaker of the House. So, um, if, however, we're talking about a repeal, excuse me, a recall for the Lieutenant Governor, the Secretary of State, or the Attorney General, um, you still have to wait that 95 days. Once you've turned in the signatures and they're all valid and good and everything, you still have to wait the 95 days. So that, again, makes you look at the March 16th date. And at that point, again, it would be the, um, you'd have a, a primary election because that, any of those, if you recall the Lieutenant Governor, the Secretary of State, or the Attorney General, it actually gets to go to a normal recall election that we think about, where we get to have other candidates put their name in the hat, so to speak. So first you would have a recall primary election, and those are only held in May, August, or November. And that's according to 
So at that point, um, once a recall primary election is announced, within 10 days from that announcement, political party, <laughs> political party candidates, such as uh, the uh, Republican Party, the Democrat Party, the Constitution Party, um, which in Michigan is the U.S. Taxpayers Party, um, I don't remember what all other parties have ballot access at this point in Michigan, but any other party, political party candidates, um, they can either pay $100 to enter themselves into the primary election for that particular office, or they can file a nominating petition that has between 1,500 and 3,000 signatures. And that is required under MCL 168.970C. So if the Lieutenant Governor, the Secretary of State, or the Attorney General, whichever one we're talking about, and just to make this example easier, let's just say it's the Lieutenant Governor. If the Lieutenant Governor fights the recall and they intend to stay in office, and to, um, you know, keep going beyond this recall election. Then in this case, because the lieutenant governor is part of the Democratic Party, there would be no Democratic Party primary election. So uh, there would be no other Democrat candidates for this um, lieutenant governor recall election race, okay? And that's looking at a combination of MCL 168.970B and MCL 168.970C. So, um, then, for a recalled general election, that would be held uh, the next in the next May or August election after that primary election has completed. And that's required under MCL 168.970E. The top candidates from each political party make it to the ballot. So let's say um, Gilchrist wants to go ahead and fight it and remain the uh, Democrat Party candidate. There is no recall. He's just automatically placed on the general election ballot. So he skips that primary race. Then you look at all the other political party candidates that completed um, or won the party nomination for each of their parties. So you'd have somebody, Susie Smith from the Republican Party and uh, Jack from the um, Constitution Party and Fred from whichever other political party that has ballot access. All of those top candidates from each of those political parties would make it to that general election ballot. Um, so if you don't have a um, political party, if you just want to run, as in this example um, for lieutenant governor, without being associated with any political party, you can do so, and um, what you would need is between 3,000 and 5,000 signatures to be filed within 10 days after the recall general election is scheduled. So you'd have 10 days to turn in between 3,000 and 6,000 signatures to get yourself on that general election ballot. So that general election in this example would be happening in August of 2021. Then the person whoever received the most votes in that race, that candidate would complete that term of office and that is under MCL 168.975. So in those circumstances, uh, I just wanted to lay out for you what the recall would look like and what different pieces are involved. So assuming the recall, well, let me step up and say, step back and say that the, um, the only approved recall language right now is um, scheduled to begin circulating um, July 29th, just to be safe, just depending on how that date goes. So July 29th means that this deadline could, um, it's going to start moving a little bit faster than what I said. So instead of October 12th being that point where you'd start collecting signatures, it would be July 29th. So everything else I said could move up that little bit. However, once you get to the um, 
the point of the 95 days, that would be sooner than the date I gave you, which would have been in March. However, there's still no um, election that that could take place in, in February, March, or April. We would still have to wait until May 2021. So even if we get enough signatures going for uh, Chad's recall petition language that he submitted and had approved a while back now, it still would not get us a new governor any sooner than May of 2021. And if it's going to be someone for Lieutenant Governor, the Secretary of State, or the Attorney General, uh, those individuals can still be recalled as well. But those individuals could be recalled and removed from office no sooner than August of 2021. So it's a little over a year from now. Okay, so I think that answers all of that. And um, now I wanted to address the emergency, um, the repeal of the 1945 statute. So the repeal of the 1945 statute, again, going in the same direction, it's not a bad thing in and of itself. However, it's not going to end what's happening right now in our state. Our, um, our governor is trying to play this game where she's saying she's relying on one statute and not another, but if you look at the actual documents that have been submitted, if you look at the um, history of how our executive orders have been used here in the state of Michigan, clearly getting rid of the 1945 Act is not going to stop her from trying to use these emergency powers. So what do I mean by that? For example, quick example, if you look online, Actually, you can go to the secretary, excuse me, you can go to the legislature's website yourself to view these. Otherwise, I've pulled them, printed them, summarized them, um, not summarized them. I've printed them and highlighted them and scanned them all in as different chunks on my website, which is the RestoreFreedomMI.com website under Documents, uh, Resources and Documents. Um, you can see that since 1993, between 1993 and 2019, there were about, I want to say it was 600 and five executive orders that were issued during that time between all the governors that um, were in place during that period of time. 25 of those executive orders related to emergency powers. Of each of those 25 executive orders for emergency powers, each of them referred to the 1976 Emergency Management Act as its source of authority for doing so. In fact, none of them even referred to the 1945 Emergency Powers of Governor Act for a source of authority to do that at all. In fact, only one of any of those emergency power executive orders even mentioned the 1945 Emergency Powers of Governor Act. And it was mentioned as a contextual reference but not a source of authority to issue these executive orders. The interesting thing about that is seven of those emergency power executive orders that were issued solely basing it off of the 1976 statute and not even referencing the 1945 statute were issued by Governor Whitmer herself in 2019. So, what are some other issues though? Um, what's happening with the 1976 statute? Why would we be worried about that one staying on the books? Well, um, first of all, we need to realize that the problem is not just that the governor is doing this on her own accord. Our rights are being violated. Our constitutional rights are being violated by these executive orders that are trying to tell us uh, when we can go to work, how we can go to work, uh, whether we have to wear a mask in public, which is defini definitely not a settled aspect of, of science or medicine anyway, uh, but certainly violates the basic notions of human dignity and uh, individual freedom. Um, we have the right to travel that's been impacted. We have intr intrastate and interstate commerce that's been impacted. We have 
a variety of laws that are and, and rights that have been impacted in significant ways and the problem is not so much that it's the governor that's doing it because quite frankly should the legislature be able to do that to us either no the legislature does not have the right to take away our rights ever but that's what the argument has been if we actually stop and peel the onion back a little bit and look at what's inside the argument that's been put forth in court is the governor has done something wrong because she's taking away the legislature's right to control us and abridge our constitutionally protected freedoms. I'm not okay with the legislature doing it. I'm not okay with the governor doing it. I don't care if it's Democrats or Republicans doing it. It's not okay. I don't care if it's for 14 days or 28 days. It's not constitutional for them to do that. So the entirety of the premise behind the whole 1976 Emergency Management Act would need to go away completely anyway. Aside from that, though, we do have a governor currently that is saying, well, even under the 1976 Act, if we forget the 1945 Act and we just look at the 1976 Act, she claims that she can issue a state of emergency or state of disaster and then if the legislature chooses to not extend that under the language of the law, that she can then just terminate that state of emergency and then restart or begin anew another state of emergency or state of disaster. And then the 28-day time frame starts all over again. That's what she's already claiming. It's not sound, but that's what she's doing. So the 1976 statute definitely has problems as well. We also need to look at another piece of the 1976 Emergency Management Act, though, and that is 30, MCL 30.411. So this is the personal liability statute, and this is the part where the governor has tried to explain how it's such an awesome thing. In fact, a lot of legislatures, legislators have argued that this is such an awesome thing because what it does is it serves to protect the frontline workers, the people that, um, you know, the medical workers, the ambulance workers, the doctors, the nurses, those that are going right into the hospitals and the hot zones, so to speak, to take care of people who are coming down with COVID-19. Uh, that's not all that this does. In fact, if we look at it, again, MCL 30.411, says that the state or any part of the state government is not liable for any personal injury or property damage sustained by any person um, appointed or acting as a member of disaster relief forces. So they're expressly uh, limiting any kind of liability if you go in and you are a um, any kind of disaster relief personnel and you're doing your job and you experience personal injury or property damage then you cannot sue the government for that it's not protecting the frontline workers it's harming the frontline workers because when they go in and they sacrifice they are then told oh but if the government screwed up on this you can't sue them you're on your own. That's a CYA thing for the governor and the state of Michigan. That's not protecting any of the individual people that are actually making the sacrifices. Also, subdivision um, C3 on this, um, excuse me, this is um, section 3 on this, says that the, um, the state when it's engaged in disaster relief activity is not liable for the death of an individual, the injury of an individual, or for any damage to property that results from that activity. So they're saying to the general public, hey, uh, we might make some bad choices or you know do things we really shouldn't be doing, but we're not going to be at fault for anything. You can't sue us if you die because of the choices we make. You can't sue us if you 
um, experience some sort of personal injury from this. You can't sue us if you experience any kind of damage to your property because of this. We're just not allowed to be sued at all. Um, the additional piece to this is that the disaster relief workers are immune um, well, first of all, the employees of the state, I should say, are immune from tort liability. So any kind of government representatives at all that are the ones making these decisions and taking these actions, which then would cause death of someone, injury to someone, or damage to their property, they are relieved of any kind of tort liability. So you can't sue the state and you can't sue that individual who's responsible. That's CYA for the state and for the governor. That doesn't protect the people. Um, there is a provision in there later on that does talk about, <coughs> excuse me, that those who are actually rendering aid in terms of providing medical care and whatnot, uh, that they are more protected from liability, but that's like the afterthought in Section 4. Um, the interesting thing here is that it's not just in an actual time of emergency that this can be utilized. A disaster relief activity that might result in death, personal injury, or property damage where the state and the government officials making those calls are not liable at all to repair or pay for any of it, that includes training for an actual impending mock or even a practice disaster or emergency. Isn't that nice? So the governor has the power under the 1976 Emergency Management Act to run all kinds of drills that violate our rights and lead to the death or injury of someone or destruction of their property and the governor and the whole state cannot be sued even if it's just a drill getting ready for such an event. That's under the 1976 statute. I don't think you'd want that in there either. Under the 1976 statute there's also 30.405, MCL 30.405. That allows them to commandeer or utilize private property that's necessary to cope with the disaster or emergency. Also, the governor is allowed to compel the evacuation of the population in any given area. She can control the ingress and egress of an area or the removal of people. She can remove people from an area of the state she deems to be necessary. And she can control or limit the occupancy or whether you're allowed to live in your own home. She can also suspend or limit the sale, dispensing, or even transportation of alcohol, which clearly she doesn't care to limit that, explosives, and combustibles. So let's think about this. She can suspend the sale, dispensing, or transportation of explosives like ammonium nitrate for farming, or ammunition, or fire extinguishers, or airbags in the production of vehicles or repair of vehicles, pest control devices, or fireworks. Well, clearly they tried to shut down all the 4th of July festivities that we had, so um, yeah, I could see why they tried to do that as well. So it does say for the ammunition that uh, that subsection or that section is not um, authorizing the seizure or taking of lawfully possessed firearms or ammunition. So if you already own it, they can't take it, but they could stop you from buying it, dispensing it, selling it, or transporting it. So if you run out of bullets and you need some sort of mechanism to protect yourself or your family from anything, then I guess you're out of luck there. But well, let's look at combustibles. These are the kinds of things that she, under the Emergency Management Act of 1976, is allowed to stop the sale of. 
rubbing alcohol, nail polish and, and nail polish remover, hairspray, non-dairy creamer, gasoline, paint thinner, paint, hand sanitizer, sunscreen, fabric softener, oranges, powdered sugar, and shoe polish. Clearly she's already decided earlier on that some items are essential and some are non-essential and so you can't buy some things but you can buy others. So this specifically says a laundry list of things that she is allowed to say no more sales on those items. That's under the Emergency Management Act of 1976. Further, under this particular statute, she is allowed to direct all other actions which are necessary and appropriate under the circumstances. And it doesn't say who gets to decide that. So I guess that's her. She gets to decide if something is necessary and appropriate. And she gets to then have open season to do whatever she wants to us because it says direct all other actions. She can tell us anything else that she wants to do. And the interesting thing is, if you violate this section, if you willfully disobey her, it's a misdemeanor. Otherwise, even if you interfere with the implementation of any of these rules or orders or directives, then you're also guilty of a misdemeanor. Yeah, it doesn't sound unconstitutionally vague, does it? But of course, let's not us, let, let us not forget the MCL 30.421 section, which is in the Emergency Ma Management Act of 1976, which says that if, there, if the governor declares that there's any kind of heightened state of alert necessary here, she actually has, instead of the 28 days, she has 60 days to control the state under these advanced or heightened police powers without even consulting the legislature. 60 days in the Emergency Management Act of 1976, MCL 30.421. And it's a misdemeanor to violate this section as well. But let's say we actually get the 1945 Act repealed and that the group doing that also decides to repeal the 1976 Act. Then we still have a bunch of other statutes which cause us a lot of trouble which violate our rights, which have been used very recently during this whole COVID thing. So let's look at the Public Health Code and start with MCL 333.5207. Under this, the um, local health department or whomever in, in their st stead can get a court order to take an individual, as long as there's a reasonable cause, it's not a very high burden of proof, that that individual is a carrier. A carrier of what? It's not defined here. They're just a carrier, something bad. They're allowed to take that individual into custody and transport them for this care, uh, for observation, examination, testing, diagnosis, and treatment. Forced treatment. And then they can temporarily detain after that. Who pays for that? Statute doesn't say who gets to pay for that. Um, it also says that this whole thing can be done with an ex parte order, meaning there's no notice or opportunity to be heard. You can have a judge issue an order requiring you to be essentially arrested and forcefully treated for COVID without you even knowing that hearing ever took place. In fact, they can, um, all they need to do is prove that there's a reasonable cause to believe that there's a likelihood that you are a carrier. That's it. The burden is so low, I can't even reach that far towards the ground. The, um, the law further says, again, this is MCL 333.5207, that uh, the individual can be detained um, up to 72 hours, excluding Saturdays, Sundays, and any legal holidays without a court hearing to even determine if this detention should continue. So you can be detained, let's say it's um, Memorial Day or Labor Day weekend, 
Okay, so let's say you're picked up. You're allowed to be detained for that Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then Monday is the legal holiday. Yikes. So then on Tuesday, you finally get to have a hearing to determine whether they get to let you out after they have already picked you up, transported you, observed you, examined you, tested you, diagnosed you, and treated you. All before you have the right to have even one hearing. You can also look at the public health code portion of MCL 333.2453, which says that an, an emergency order may be issued to prohibit the gathering of people for any purpose. And then expressly states that emergency procedures are not limited to just this one law. There's going to be others out there. So the health department can also provide for the involuntary detention and treatment of individuals. Isn't that nice? These pieces are in MCL 333.2453. These are not anything related to the 1976 Act or the 1945 Act. So if we're going to repeal statutes, there's no reason why we can't be circulating petitions right now to repeal the 1945 Act and the 1976 Act and at least some of these other public health code acts. But I'm not doing the repeal, so that's not on me. That's for those individuals. So that then leads me to the... Restore Freedom Initiative Petition. The Restore Freedom Initiative Petition is a petition to amend the Michigan State Constitution. This is an amendment done under a portion of our Constitution. Um, yeah, I don't have it right in front of me. Um, it is not the portion of our state Constitution talking about um, revision. This is not a general revision. This is an amendment, and I'll go into detail on that in just a minute in another video. Um, but number one, this Restore Freedom Initiative petition is changing our state constitution to rein back in the power the government is currently exercising, to prevent future abuses of power by the governor, the legislature, and the courts, including in times of emergency, to restore Michigan to a government of the people, by the people, and for the people, as is required by our U.S. Constitution. Of course, you can find a ton more information on our Restore Freedom Initiative petition at RestoreFreedomMI.com. But to give you a few examples of how all this is done. Number one, it clarifies and strengthens our right to not be deprived of life, liberty, or property and what that looks like, other than just being told it's under due process of law. Also, if you don't want governors trying to create law, well, then you'll like how this amendment clarifies the separation of powers. It also clarifies the um, enforceability or non-enforceability of unconstitutional laws and a legal or unconstitutional governor action. For example, when there's an executive order violating the U.S. or Michigan Constitution, this clarifies exactly how that is not enforceable from the get-go. We don't need a court to sort that out. It, this constitutional amendment also spells out that the government officials just can't pick and choose which laws they want to follow. That's already a thing, but it spells it out, so there's no more wiggle room when, with regard to that. It reiterates that the government gets no additional powers over us in times of emergency. It establishes a true system of government accessibility, accountability, and transparency. It doesn't allow for all the current loopholes that are in the Emergency Management Act or the Open Meetings Act, which, by the way, the governor thinks she can set aside in times of emergency. The Restore Freedom Initiative Constitutional Amendment Petition makes legislators do their own research and draft their own bills. So they can't just simply rely on unelected, overpaid attorneys to write all the laws and then tell them how to vote on them. And any 
anything even likely to impair health. Like having to wear masks in the current environment all day long everywhere you go cannot be required upon anyone. Streamlining court jurisdiction so the average resident can easily understand the court process and adequately be able to participate in it. That's part of the Restore Freedom Initiative petition. In fact, laws must be reasonably understandable by the average citizen with this amendment. And one of the best things is that administrative rules and regulations, executive orders, or governmental internal policies and procedures can no longer be used to regulate the people. Laws can regulate the people. That's it. Laws. Not all these other things that parade around and masquerade around as laws. Roll call votes would be required for all governmental decisions. So uh, particular legislators or whomever won't be able to hide behind any kind of voice vote. And this prohibits any unelected boards or commissions from exercising any power or control over the people in any way because unelected boards or commissions or officials should never have the ability to regulate the people. That's not what part of a Republican form of government is all about. And that's required under Article 4, Section 4 of our U.S. Constitution. So this Restore Freedom Initiative petition restores our government to a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. And it reigns in those governmental uh, powers that our current government is trying to utilize in excess of what they're supposed to be doing. And it stops any future abuses from ever happening again. So that differentiates those three petitions. And um, I'll look forward to any questions. Um, thank you. And I will come back on and do... A video to explain the um, two of the more common or more recent miscommunication or I should say misinformation um, campaigns out there um, regarding this constitutional amendment petition. Thanks guys.